everybody, it's Michael Finkley with The Michael Finkley Show. And I'm Nicole with Conversations with Nicole. You can join me Wednesdays at 9 a.m. on all of my streaming platforms. Well, Nikki, don't forget about The Michael Finkley Show, Mondays, 12 p.m. Eastern Standard Time on the CTR Media Network. Join okay. us! What's going on, beautiful people? My name is Prince Horkbaum, and I play Jacob in Fate and Seduction, and you guys are watching The Michael Finkley Show. On the next Michael Finkley, Pastor Eartha Edwards stops by. We discuss her music and her Stella Award nomination. And Low Key Bahamut is back with us, Fink Fam, to discuss his new documentary, Dying to Vote. Monday. There's sitting with Stella Award nominee. Of course, I'm chatting with Pastor Eartha Edwards. How are you? I'm great. How are you? And thank you for having me. You're very welcome. Very welcome. Now, I've been in Mons all my life, and this is actually our first time meeting. Uh, I know our, our church, just, um, we fellowship one another, but just having a conversation with you, I'm excited for this I'm opportunity. So thank you. Thank you for allowing this to happen. You're so welcome. We appreciate you. Now, I must ask, okay, so when you think of Eartha Edwards, everything else aside, Eartha Edwards, let's finish this statement. Eartha Edwards is blank. How would you finish that? The only thing that came to my mind was Eartha Edwards is a worshiper. Uh, um, oh, God, I could say a whole lot of things, but um, I guess what's in the forefront um, right at this moment because of what God is doing is my sincerity in loving God. Mm -hmm. So, have you yeah. always been a worshiper? Um, pretty much all my life. Pretty much all my life. Started young um, uh, in the church. We've been in, you know, a, I'm in a Christian home. Mm -hmm. Raised, I was raised in a Christian home, so I've been around worship yeah. without an understanding because my mom uh, was a pastor. And she was a praying woman. Mm -hmm. She was a woman that, that, that sincerely loved God. It wasn't lip service. She loved God from the inside. So I saw that demonstrated in my mom. And um, we were raised up in a, a little white Pentecostal church. And so it was, it was always around me, worshiping God, praising God. But I did not have that personal relationship until around about the age of... 14, 15, and then you know some things happen in teen. Yeah. You do some stuff. You go out and you come back in. <laughs> I'm so grateful for his grace. His grace is grace. But um, so I had a little bit of hiccups along the way. Uh, but around 18, I made my mind up. Okay, I'm a, I'm gonna live this life. This is going to be my lifestyle, and and that's how it has been. You know. Yeah. And I tell you, you know, living, living for God is, is amazing. You know, yes. I tell you, uh, the world offers so much, but he offers even more. Oh, God, <laughs> if we can just realize that. That's so true. So true. So much more. So let's go back to that 11-year-old you. You're standing in front of this big congregation at this convention, and you are leading this song for the very first time. What is going through young Eartha's mind at this point? Yes, I was about 11. I think I was 11 years old. And um, the organization is called PAW. Mm -hmm. I know everybody have heard of uh, Pentecostal Assembly of the World. Uh, we had a rehearsal, and I was the only child in that rehearsal. Mama, mama said, you singing and hollering around the house, you want to you go to this rehearsal. So um, uh, everybody was um, adults. I was the only child, and I sung a song kneel at the cross and and so uh, you know at at that young age i've always that traditional style um has always been in me um so singing that song um 
some were looking on it. It's like, okay, what does she know about kneeling at the cross, leaving all your care? And uh, it went over great. The people praised the Lord. The people were, I mean, they, some were running around the church. And um, I said, you know what? This is what I want to do. This is what I want to do. I want to do this. I want to be able to uh, worship God, to sing, and people are encouraged or edified, uplifted. This is what I want to do. I knew at that age that that was going to be something that, a tool, you know, that God would use in my life. I knew it was going to be a tool that God would use in my life to encourage people, um, to edify people. Demons to be cast out. <laughs> so, yeah, so I, I knew at an early age, and um, it was at that point I knew that um, this is what I want to do, this is what I'm going to do, and um, the relationship began to build. And that's what made all the difference the relationship. The relationship, because, you know, many people can sing, a lot of them can sing and, and hit higher notes than I hit, but. Um, Relationship makes a difference. Mm. It makes a difference. Mm. Now that's a <laughs> mouthful, right? They pass, pastor, <laughs> pastor. That is, that is definitely a mouthful. Relationship experience, all tangled up in there. Yeah. Um, in that right, and you've been singing ever since. I've been singing ever since, and I've always been uh, the shy little girl. Mm. Always been shy, but when it, when it came to getting out there and ministering in song. Um, I was just in a different zone, yeah. in a different zone. And afterwards, I get back in my little shell. Um, but um, just that opportunity to minister in song. And I've always uh, had that desire. I said, Lord, take my voice to the nations. You know, I want this to be worldwide. You know, because I believe that, uh, you know, I have him on the inside. And it shows forth. I believe it shows forth. So when people say things like something different about you, I would say, well, my God, aren't I, we all Christians, right? But, you know, <laughs> but I'm beginning to understand. I mean this thing. Exactly. You know, I, I mean it from my heart. Exactly. Yeah. It shows. We've seen you perform. We've seen you minister through song of music. And it definitely shows in that right. So I must ask, what has gospel music done for you all this many years? Um, this, this, just the opportunity of going out and um, singing gospel songs, and um, it, it's definitely, it definitely changed my life. You know, it gave me the opportunity to, uh, like I said, I've been doing it all my life. All my life I've been worshiping, but having the opportunity to go out into different uh, venues, to go out into different churches, and I had an opportunity to go in a couple of clubs, you know, um, with cafes and, you know, me being, you know, I, I got to get it together because I guess, are they drinking over there? <laughs> but, yeah, yeah, yeah. Go ahead and sip your stuff. But we, yes, yes, yes. yes. So I'm, I'm grateful for those type of opportunities. Uh, uh, God said in his word, he said he's going to make our name great. And I believe that's what he's doing. Uh, you know. I just believe that's what he's doing. Now, it kind of came up on me suddenly on the day of Pentecost, you know. <laughs> so it came up on me suddenly. Um, I've, tell, I've, told, I've said to a lot of people, you know, God, I'm just shocked. Not, not because I didn't think God was going to do it. You know, my mom spoke prophetically in my life before she passed. And she said, the things that I'm doing now that I would be doing. And not only my mom, so many other people. I knew God was going to do it, but, um, you know, I just kind of had it off my mind. I'm going to do what I'm doing and worshiping from my heart. And it just came up on me all of a, all of a, all of a sudden. I mean, I, I'm older, older. Mature. So I would have thought, mature. <laughs> mature, I like that uh -huh. word. So I thought it would happen 30 years ago, mm -hmm. you know, yeah. uh, but... But isn't his time? It's so his great. time, and his, it, his it's time yes, so yes. Because yes. I, I feel that if it would have happened sooner, you would, you would appreciate it more, like you do now. Um, I'm so appreciate it. Mind setting, mm -hmm. right? So mm -hmm. his time is always great. Yes, his time is yes. always great. So we're gonna let's, let's dive into it. Let's talk about the Stellar Awards. Let's talk oh about the God. Stellar Awards. Okay. Yeah. So you are nominated for a traditional female artist of the year. Yes. You're in the same category as Jacqueline Carr, Moret Brown Clark. And also Lucinda Moore. Feelings. What's Lord. going on in your mind? <laughs> um, my goodness. I think that's the shocking part of it. 
you know, to be in a lineup like that. These people are legends, and God put me among them. And so I'm, 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 I'm humbled. I'm, I'm grateful. Um, I've listened to all of them. I've sung, sung their music. So, you know, it just, it's just a good, good feeling to know, know that God would line me up in that particular list. Uh, so I'm, I'm grateful. I'm grateful. Okay, the angelic gospel singers, they were a part of my life also. And they um, composed a song, uh, Touch Touch me, Lord Jesus. And then she would, you know, she had that hum. Mm. And so um, that's how that that's how I was raised, hearing those type things. I remember at 11 years old, this is what really amazed uh, a, a lot of people. And uh, the church was full of people. And, and I was singing, feeling my song. And I got to um, the, the title of the song was Kneel at the Cross. Um, leave every care. I believe that Jesus will meet you there. And I got to a particular point and be began to hum. And that root came from people like the angelic voices. And so um, that tradition, that's my identity. That's, that, that's, how I was, I, that's how I was raised. So, you know. Again, I love the part of the scripture where it says, you know, our gift will make room for us and set us up for a great man, you know, and that's what God is doing. You better preach. <laughs> <laughs> well, you feel like David, the word of the Lord is hidden in my heart. That's then, right. That's that right. Part. So, you know, I, I, I'm so excited for you. So in being from very, a, a very small town of Mullins, right, living here, pastoring here, your, your family's here, you know, what does that mean to you and now on this national platform that people who now can see who you are as an artist, as a gospel artist. Oh God, that means a lot. There is greatness in Mullins. Yes, and so remember that. <laughs> yes, yes. Yeah. And I'm I'm just so grateful that God is using my life as an example. I'm I'm really humbled by that. Um uh, so many people uh, it's just surprising the way it, the people that will come up and say Ah, I have hope now. Yeah. Uh, you know, I, I wasn't expecting those type of conversations. I um, had a young man to uh, say, he said, I've been trying, I've been pushing for about 20 years. And to, to see that you've been nominated gives me hope. So um, those type things excites me because my life is being an encouragement to someone else to hear things, and uh, many people have said along that line, you know, um, I'm encouraged, I'm, I, I, I have an extra push now to see that you've been nominated. And I, I'm just, you know, I'm just, I'm just grateful. I'm, I'm just grateful. I can't say that enough. I'm, I'm so grateful that God, God used me, exactly. used my life. Exactly. Uh, I'm, I'm so grateful. I love that. I really do. Oh, my word. This is exciting. This it is it exciting. really is exciting. It, I, it's a, I must ask, with the support factor, what has support been like for you, every, along with ministry, but now again with this nomination under your belt, especially for Mullins, mm. Mullins natives? They have been so supportive, and, um, and, th and that's amazing because initially when I started out, um, I was like, okay, gosh, people that I expected to push they were they were not there, um, and uh, you know uh, I I was like looking looking and searching. I'm out here, y'all. Y'all see me out here trying and struggling. Uh, give me some words or something. But I didn't get it right off. I didn't get it right off. But as um, as time go as as time went on, um, the support. Uh, I don't know if you know Miko. Uh, Miko, oh Miko, I tell you, Miko is a well-known person, isn't she? Mm -hmm. Pick forty-two. Um, I was invited to the Juneteenth on June fifteenth, and I'm I, I'm really honored, really honored and humbled to take part in that. And so, uh, people like Miko, I've been a support. Um, um, Robert Woodbury, you, you know him? May, yes, 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 yes. It's nothing for him to text me and say, I'm proud of you. Um, my bishop, Bishop Michael Blue, um, Pastor Melinda, Pastor Melinda was telling me I was going to get nominated before it even happened. And um, so I have support, even um, a group of people getting together, they're having a nomination party. 
um, on June 9th, which is my birthday. Okay. But on June 9th. Are you serious? Yes. Okay, come on here. <laughs> wow, wow. So yeah, June 9th, um, and uh, they are getting together. Just want to do. I said, and I told them. I said, yeah, you don't have to do that, but they are doing it up on June the 9th. Having they're having a nomination party. So I've I've had great support, great support. Um, last Sunday. Um, Bishop Michael Blue, WJAY 98.5, they had FM, they had this um, big uh, concert, and he asked me to minister in song on that particular platform. And just platforms like that has opened so many, yeah. platforms like that open so many doors. And so um, I'm grateful. I, the support is phenomenal. I, uh, it's, a, it's a passage in scripture, you know, when the life is done down here, you want to hear, well done, that good and faithful servant. But at times, we want to hear here, where we're on the earth, okay. as well. Okay. You know, and it's that encouragement needed to continue on to go to the next level. What's next for Pastor Eartha Edwards? Oh, my. Oh, my. Um, well, there are some places that I know that I, I, I've been to Africa before. But one of the next things, I don't know if I should say it yet, but um, let me go and put it in the air. Um, <laughs> but, <laughs> but we've been talking about recording in Africa. I love um, the continent of Africa. I love the culture. I love uh, the way that the praise um, is all the same, but the style is just different. The, the, the tone is different. So um, we are working on recording in Africa and so Kenya. So I'm excited. I am excited about that um, uh, in the process of, of doing some, some videos and so forth. Uh, just trying to get it out there even the more. Um, when it comes to the nomination, and I, I've said this before, uh, I've been doing this all my life, all my life. It's my lifestyle. Uh, so I, I was thinking, Lord, whether I, I, whether I get nominated or not, I'm still going to praise you. And, you know, um, but um, it is great. The nomination is really great because it opened up other doors, you know. So I'm excited about that because already it has opened up other doors for me. And um, so I'm going to use all of that and move forward and go to the nations. To the nations. You know, God has allowed my music to be serviced in London and places like Africa and so forth. And I just want it to go as far as it can go. There you go. So that means I'm going to have to work. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Not a, not a problem at all. So in all that you've done thus far in your life, music, ministry, are you proud of yourself? I am. I am. I, I am. Uh, I remember um, when I received the call that I've been nominated, I looked up, I said, God, you did that thing. <laughs> so, yeah, you, I, I, I'm, I'm totally proud. Yeah. Yeah. I, I know it was God. And... Um, you know, sometimes people are count you out along the way, but God, but God, I told one of the people, uh, one of the pr people on my team, um, and I, I won't go into what it was all about, but I told him, I said, you know, don't sleep on me. I got God on the inside, you know. Say so. <laughs> <laughs> Say yeah, so. I said, God to use my little old life and take it, it all over the world. I, I just believe that. I just believe that. I believe that. I believe that. Uh, you, you know, no haltiness in it or anything. I know that God, God is God, and I know that he lives in me, and he knows that I'm sincere about what I'm doing. So I believe God is going to launch it even more. I, I just believe that. I believe that. Yeah. I love it. I love it. Don't sleep on her. Don't <laughs> sleep on her. I, I wrote a song a few years ago. I sing as well. You sing. I, I a little note. A whole little note. And it talks about accomplishing your dreams. You know, the determination behind it, all the good stuff that comes along with accomplishing your dreams. What is your next biggest dream? Africa. Africa is in my dream. That's in, um, that's in my spirit. Uh, I feel like that's a place that 
that God is going to allow me to go. I've been to Africa before, but I want to go and record. So that's a part, that's a part of my dream. And to um, being a worship leader, uh, my desire is to um, minister on platforms like Joyce Meyer. I love her. I love her. Um, T.D. Jakes to get up and do worship before they get up and kind of set the atmosphere before they get up and, and, and minister. I mean, I love traveling and going to these different uh, venues. Uh, I've been to all of them, quartet and so forth, but my heart is worship. That's my heart. And so um, those are some of my future dreams. So will we hear more music in 2024? Come from Pastor Edwards? Yes, yes, yes. Um, we are working on a couple of things. Uh, you know, some people are, are you a songwriter? I am. Uh, does it just come quickly? It does. I'm right, I can ride in the car, I'm in the house. And these, See, that's good. Yeah. I don't know what the problem is with me, but when it comes to songwriting, um, I have to have a dream. Uh, like one of my songs I wrote, derived from a dream mm -hmm. um, and um, or, or I'll start writing it take me months to write it then those then there are those people like you that can just write at the drop of a dime so um, yeah uh, I want God to really really develop that in me but we are working on some new some new music um, the Lord gave me two new songs and um, but I, I'm grateful to our, our album I wrote all of those songs uh, but those songs span, all of those songs with the exception of one, but it spanned over about three years. I said, Amazing. Oh. <laughs> Amazing. Amazing. Continue to bring on the good stuff. We need it. We need the encouragement. We need the inspiration, especially in 2024. Uh, I, someone is looking at you now as an example, as a model. What, are you, what would you say as an individual that's saying that I want to be like Pastor Eartha Edwards? Uh, don't quit. Don't quit. You, you have to keep going. Um, uh, the main thing, especially is to those that are, are sold out into gospel, um, we really do have to realize that relationship with God is, is necessary, is a must. Um, uh, so I would, encourage, I would encourage them to continue, 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 keep going. Mm -hmm. Don't quit. Um, and also... Um, and when you get into it, don't allow the industry to change you. You know, that's, that's really important because I, I'm at a stage in my life where everybody's trying to tell me what I need to do. And some, some of it don't agree with my spirit. Mm -hmm. So I, I would encourage uh, those that are in it and going in it or in it now, um, continue to be you. Continue to allow God to lead you in the midst of it. Listen to others because, because God do put other people in your life um, to guide you. But do not allow the industry to change you because I've seen it happen even over this small span of time that I've been in it. Yeah, food yeah. for thought, definitely. Yeah. Yeah. How can we follow you on social media? All of my social media handles are on my website, EarthaEdwardsMinistries.com. And you can stream all of my music on all streaming platforms. All right, there you go. And I, I must say, before we leave Fink Fam, you have to become, you're now family. You're now family of the Fink, um, of the Michael Finkley Show. Oh, we I'm have to make it permanent, though, because I have this amazing mug. I have the mug for Oh, you I now. get a mug. You get a mug. You get a mug. So in your, you drink coffee? Yes, yes, drinker. yes. So now this is your official coffee mug. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you. You're the so Michael welcome. Finkley Show. Yeah, so um, show it proudly, use it proudly, and I appreciate you so much for being with us. Congratulations again. Congrats. Thank you so much. Thank you again for having me. Uh, you're so welcome. <laughs> and again, Fink Fam, the Stella Awards will be this next month, July 20th in um, Las Vegas, Nevada. Uh, definitely be on the lookout for our nominee right here from Mullins, South Carolina, Pastor Eartha Edwards. Thank you so much. Thank you. You're welcome. Fink Fam, don't go away. Back in a moment. What's good? It's your boy Reggie Gaskins, and listen, let me tell y'all something. You're watching your boy, the Michael Finkley Show. So stop what you're doing. 
Put that down. Put the remote down. Put it down. And watch your boy Michael Fink. Yeah, you know I mean, yeah, you know I mean. Hello, everybody. It's Finkley from the Finkley Experience. We're an educational consulting firm that specializes in first-generation education. So we assist students with their college and career endeavors. We train school administrators on the state of first-generation students. And also, we partner with colleges and universities to assist their first-generation population for easy transition from high school to college. So if you're looking for a presenter or a speaker that presents on these topics and so much more, visit our website at thefinkleyexperience.com and learn about all that we do. We're looking forward to working with you. Looking for some of the best soul food right here in Mullen, South Carolina? I promise you. Come on down to Garden Alley. Salad fabulous, or water ganger, potato salad, or chicken and scratch, macaroni and cheese, salted perfection. I haven't found anything that's not great. <laughs> Best we have. Banana pudding, cakes, pies. Yeah. Selection is huge. Uh, Garden Alley is an awesome place to eat. I really love it. Come by and see the amazing staff at Garden Alley, downtown Mullins. Everybody, welcome back to the Michael Finkley Show. Now, I'll tell you, this next guest is probably on, on my show more than I have. Uh, uh, he has an amazing new project that he's been working on. Uh, we're definitely going to talk about it as well. Uh, he is my good friend, even though he belongs to that other fraternity. But my good friend, <laughs> Only the best Al, uh, Emmy Award winning filmmaker, producer, Loki Mahalan. How are you? Oh, doing all right, doing all right. I had to get you. I had to get you. I had to get you. It's, it's, it's happy days, man. I mean, we're going to be talking about dying happy to vote. To remind people, you know, the power of the vote and why we need to vote and those who died for the right to vote. So, Exactly. And you also mentioned in your, in your film, Dying to Vote, about the activities on January 6th as well. And yeah. how it all ties into a bigger picture. Right, uh, right. Yeah, because January 6th, I mean, this is, so the film is centered on the Vernon Dammer story in 1966. This is after the Voting Rights Act, you know, when everyone can vote. Uh, the Klan didn't like that idea, so they they murdered him. They, you know, firebombed his house. He had a shootout with him. Um, and uh, he would die about 11 hours later from his wounds. Um, but, uh, and it was asked, point blank by a reporter, you know, was it worth it? Is it worth dying for? And he's like, you know, if you don't vote, you don't count. So we're centered on that story. And his son, who was there and 12 years old at the time, is, is telling us this story. Uh, and then we have Representative Benny Thompson, the chairman of the January 6th committee, talking about what it's like to be there during that time and the things that he saw. And, you know, and, and why this was important. Because we have to understand while there were people who died for the right to vote, there were people who died that day or because of that day uh, to protect our vote, right? To protect our, our democracy. And so this is, this is what it's all about. Um, and this is a companion piece to my previous film, After Selma, which is about voter suppression. So you got voter suppression, you have voter intimidation. Um, and, you know, and, and we, we stand on the shoulders of those who went before us that um, were willing to, you know, pay that price for something we seemingly take for granted. So, and that's part of that motivation, you know, to remind us. Exactly. Exactly. Yeah. I have family members to this day who have never voted before. Yep. Um, and I, it's just like, why don't you do this? You know, and. Just watching the film, thank you for allowing me to watch. Yeah. <laughs> and watching this film, it's like an eye opener of, again, why we should have exercised this right. And one thing that really stood out to me, um, I, I love history and mm -hmm. learning about it, especially being a black male in America. 
Um, so one of the events that you talked about really hit home for me um, in Wilmington, North Carolina, mm -hmm. um, how, you know, um, persons that look like me were literary officials and then persons that didn't look like them <laughs> didn't like that. So they decided to take it by force. Yeah. Um, so how were you able to tie different events along history into the bigger picture of what we see in this film? Um, you know, it was, that was kind of this, you know, build that trajectory up to where we're at, um, starting at the beginning. And there's a lot of stuff you have to leave out. There's just so much stuff that went on. So much. But I thought Wilmington was really telling simply because it was the only successful coup to ever take place in America. And, um, you know, people died, right? And it's like you said, it was, they couldn't handle the idea that there were black people who were in office in Wilmington. And this was a very integrated city at this point, right? And and the uh, city government as well. And so that was that was too much for them to handle. So there was that, you know, what you know, the laws that they're gonna pass and how it's you know it's the, the fear of losing of the uh, you know the great replacement theory. I'm sure it was alive and well then just as it is today. Um, and so they you know a Confederate colonel got on his high horse and rode into town and decided, you know, we're, we're going to, they created a white declaration of independence or something like that. Right. Wait, I'm like, well, they already had a white declaration, declaration of independence. It was just called the declaration of independence. Right. right. Uh, but they decided to make a new one called the white declaration. Just, just to be clear. Um, because they, I, they clearly felt that the declaration of independence uh, missed the mark in, re, in regard to saying everyone's created equal. Exactly. So they wanted to correct that and create a new declaration of independence. Um, and so, yeah, and, and they succeeded. Duly elected individuals that they didn't like that vote, so they, they ran them out. Yeah, um, literally. And it's yeah. said that, the, the, especially of African-Americans, I think it's like over 200, 250 yeah. individuals. And what I, what I, because you hear, you hear this, this history so much, Right. But I feel like as you get older, it makes more sense to you. Right. Because, you know, you mentioned Fannie Lou Hamer, you know, you and you mentioned so many other individuals that literally were shot and killed, you know, in front of their house or right. they were in plain sight by officials, by state officials. You know, it was just like, right. It's like they died for this just because they were trying to get people registered to vote. Right. Yeah, I mean, bland and simple. I mean, and we and we we see those same tactics today. Um, that intimidation in the last election in Arizona, you had guys that walking around with guns and stuff. You know, they're they are fifteens, whatever, and sidearms and at polling booths and things like that. I mean, it was just like the old polling station, not necessarily the booth specifically, but outside creating that. Now, legally, they could carry the guns, right? But you can see where these things are going. But let's make sure everyone can legally carry guns. So what can we do with these guns? Well, now we can carry them around near polling places, right? Um, and that's that's intimidating. You know, you you don't know. I mean, particularly when you get so many people getting shot up and stuff in schools and churches and wherever else, that now you're going to vote. You know some history. You know that they're there for you. They're not there for the people who are voting for their who they like. And so if they see you and they say, oh, that's a black person, that's a Latino, that's whomever, they're probably not voting for my candidate. So there's already a target if there wasn't one already, but there's an additional target painted on, on, on the backs of African-Americans and people of color, you know, when it comes to voter intimidation. And so that's, and that's what happened in New Jersey, right? In the eighties uh, with that wow. governor. And the crazy thing was, is that law, you know, it was like, okay, well, look, you can't do that anymore. And then you had a judge 40 years later say, I think the Republicans have learned their lesson. And the second that law was lifted, bam, they're back at it. And, and now look, and to be fair, let's just be fair, Democrats were doing the same thing prior when the Democratic Party was more conservative, particularly in the South. Now, that's not idea. That's not party. That's ideology. And that's where we always hear this sort of thing. Well, Republicans freed the slaves and they were the party of Lincoln. And this, that, and it was the Democrats that, you know, voted in Jim Crow. It's like, okay, no, well, first of all, it's the Dixiecrats. But uh, it's this is about, it's ideology. Mm -hmm. It's conservatives. What happened was, is that 
Republicans said, well, man, Democrats just aren't racist enough anymore. Oh, well, the people who were in the Democratic Party said, you know, we're not racist enough anymore, so let's go to the Republicans because the Democrats sold us out. Johnson signed the voting rights bill, the civil rights bill. So, you know, Republicans were like, hey, come on over here. Right, we got you. And that's when Ronald Reagan in Neshoba County, you know, most famously, you know, launched his political campaign in Neshoba County, Mississippi. A presidential campaign in Mississippi. Now, what happened in Neshoba County? Cheney, Goodman, and Schroeder were murdered there. Right? And he's declared state rights. So all of that is for a reason. Right? And that was already, and that had followed already the blueprint that was established by George Wallace when he ran for governor. And then Nixon took that and put it on steroids. And then Reagan just picked up from there. Right? So, I mean, and this is all in the uncomfortable truth. You know, we lay that all out already in another film. But yeah. So, all right, you got me going on tangents here now, but nonetheless. <laughs> no, I love it. It's all connected, <laughs> though. It is. No, it is. It's it all is. connected. So I don't buy it at all. I, I yeah. got to ask, you know, with this film, you know, how are you getting the message across? What are you doing to get to promote it as you're doing? Yeah. So typically with these sort of films, we would have them up on Amazon or Showtime picks them up or whatever else. And we, we elected on this time not to stream it yet. Um because there's too much content for us to consume already. So it's in one ear, out the other. What we did is we established what I'm calling grassroots screenings. So any organization can go to our website, dyingtovote.org, very easy name, dyingtovote.org. They can go to the website and sign up to host a free screening. So if you're a church, a political party, you know, uh, you know, a civics organization, someone who's running for, for office, they... There's a gentleman running for office um, and the mayor of uh, Ra Raleigh, North Carolina. So he's going to be running for office and he's hosting a screening, right? So anyone can do that. And by doing that, either virtually or in person, whatever, hybrid models, um, you know, we provide all the tools for them to be able to do that in regards to films and press release and poster or key art, that sort of stuff, to facilitate that as much as possible. And I will come on for free um, online for you know for the Q&A portion of, of people screening. So all you do is you go to the website, fill out the form, you get an email, and uh, just respond to that email saying, hey, yeah, I'd like to see the screening, because now you get some more information. And it's like, all right, well, now we'll send you a screener copy so you can review it, because you probably want to see the film before you host the screening, right? Um, and then, you know, then we just, you know, you, you, you pick your date and you host your screening. So that's how we've been been pushing this, uh, this way now after the election you know or maybe right close to the election we'll probably you know open it up further but for now we really want people to gather together watch the film it's 32 minutes long and so it's designed to fit in that hour 75 minutes maybe 90 minute block where folks can watch the film have a discussion a robust discussion about the importance of voting like we're doing right now right um and then people who are there can go you know what i think my organization could do this we had that. We had, we did a screening in Utah just recently, um, and my mom and I were actually there because we were speaking already in Utah. And so, the uh, Omega Set Phi Fraternity Incorporated, you know, the chapter out there, uh, together with the Salt Lake Community College and uh, the uh, Black Student Union, wanted to put together a screening. So, since we were there, we attended. We had a great turnout, and I think three other people that were there with, with different organizations. Like, how do we host a screening? That's the intent is to keep spreading it that way um, for these opportunities for folks to have this, to have this discussion. Because we've already we're, we already know what the plan is for you know with Trump. We already he's already told us what he's going to do. Right. He keeps telling us what he's going to do. Um, and it, 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 we, it can't happen. You know, not on our watch, not, not for those who believe in our democracy and believe in, you know, in human rights and justice and, and equality. Those of us who are actually people of our words and took that pledge of allegiance and said liberty and justice for all. You know, either we're a bunch of hypocrites or we're people of our, our words and we will, we will stand for liberty and justice for all. Right. So, and the one key way we can do that is always voting. 
um, when I watched the film, it, it showed even more so for me that, um, you know, we say it all the time, our vote matters, you know, your it counts, all that kind of good stuff. But just seeing the history again, right, just mm -hmm. hearing the testimonials again, right, and how it all relates until even present day, like you said, my vote matters even that much more now, right. um, you know, because, again, so many people have paid the price. What are you hearing from viewers when they watch this film? What are some of their reactions? Um, they're moved. People are really shocked. Uh you know, they, they're, they're surprised. I, someone has said to me that today, they said, you know this, I know it was 30 minutes long, but it felt like it was five minutes. Like it was just, it just was so much and just so gripping that they just lost track of time. It just felt like it was nothing at all in regards to time. But it was just, um, you know, they're like, yeah, I've got a bunch of people that need to see this film, you know, that run organizations and, and like NAACP chapters and so forth. And so it's, um people are you know they they want it to happen they 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 really you know just um uh, they're uh a lot of people say that you know they're 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 saddened by it because of the story that's told of, of vernon damer but they're also empowered they're reminded um and so yeah that's exactly what we wanted to happen and and to make that connection between the past and the present really surprised them you know they uh, to have that reminder was this was this phenomenal for them. So and they're motivated, which is good. I have to ask. I have to ask because again, you do some incredible work in informing persons um, of the of the expertise that you have, especially under this umbrella. Are people surprised, especially with their first time meeting you? Are they surprised in who you are as a white man, and you're 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 discussing? things like this that affect other races? Um, I don't know. I, I think when people, for the first time, they are. But a lot of people know who I am because I've been doing these films for 10 years and, and the like. And, of course, me and my mother's history. Um, but, yeah, there's 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 always going to be an element of that surprise. Um, I think there's an element of, you know, there's definitely an element of, pre of appreciation because in this time that we live in, I mean, it's like, it's it's easy to think that every white person is just a freaking racist, right? You know, uh, obviously it's not the case, but um, but the willingness to do the work, this is what we should be doing. Um, and so that's what we, we do as, you know, the, with our foundation and, and, and the like. So, um, yeah, I think it's kind of hard to say. I mean, I don't meet too many people who haven't seen my work already. So I can't say, like, you know, either they've seen it on TikTok or whatever else. But um, so it's kind of hard to say. I mean, they're, they're coming at me with, have already seen it. It's not like it's, they show it to a screen and like, well, wait a second. I, I thought, you know, I thought whatever. <laughs> so, of course, and the next thing is like, you're a cute. What? Oh, yeah. <laughs> You're the whole package, sir. <laughs> You're the whole package. Oh my word! So, what are you working on next? Uh, um, I'm working some on some YouTube series um, that I'm developing. Um, some a lot of like uh, social media shorts and things on historical stuff. We have we have these posts that we do every day um, called "This Day" and and you know well, well what what's it called um, the uh, Every month is Black History Month. So we do a lot of these historical stuff. Well, I'm going to be converting those into videos. Uh, and I have some longer form videos I want to do on YouTube. Uh, there is another documentary that we actually shot before we did this one. Um, and then, you know, we had a shot. I was getting ready to start editing and stuff. And then Jerry Mitchell, who's in my film, you know, he's in three of my films, actually. The most recent being the Emmett Till film we did, uh, White Lies, Black Death. Um, and Jerry Mitchell's the Pulitzer-nominated investigative reporter who bought Megger's Killer to Justice and actually Vernon Damer and, and so forth, like a bunch of Klansmen to Justice for murders, co-cases. Um, he said, you know, you should really think about, you know, here's a, here's a film idea. And I always get people who are like, man, you know what you should do? And I'm like, oh, great, here we go. Uh, but, you know, Jerry, it's Jerry, so I'll listen to him. I'll humor him. And he's like, you know, I said, well, Jerry, I already did one on voter 
you know, you should do one about voting rights. I said, well, I just did one on, you know, voter suppression called after Selma. He goes, no, no, no. But I'm talking about like, like, you know, like talk about like Vernon Damer and stuff. And, and I was like, oh, okay. And those who died for the right to vote, that history. And I said, oh, yeah, I'll, I'll call it dying to vote. He goes, well, that was, that was quick. How'd you get that title? Like, well, it just came to me. So, I mean, it was literally, that was the first thing I came up with was a title. And then, then it was just a race against the clock. So we shot this thing in October uh, and had it out in April. Um, and we just recently just got accepted into the, um, uh, what did we get accepted into? The uh, Martha's Vineyard African American Film Festival. So we got accepted into that. So that's cool. Um, so yeah, um, I don't know if I answered your question or not, but oh, the next film. So the next, <laughs> so what ended up happening was uh, the film that we shot is the one I'm going to start going back towards. Um, and it's a film about the Bear River Massacre, which is the largest reported massacre west of the Mississippi, possibly the largest reported ever that, you know, the ones that we know about. And this was the, the this, this film is about the, the, that central story of the Bear River Massacre um, of the uh, Western Band of the, of the Shoshone. And but it's a film about the genocide of Native Americans. So kind of take the uncomfortable truth and turn that into um, Bury My Heart at Wounded Knee, right? Um, the book. So, yeah, so that's that's what I'm working on. And, and we shot it with, well, it was literally with the, um, he was a, he's a former chief and he's the third great grandson, direct descendant of the chief at the time of the massacre. And he took me down to this spot along the river. And as we're walking there, we stop. He says, you know, beneath our feet are the bones of my ancestors. We were on the site where the massacre took place. And he said, and he turned to me and he literally said, you know, will you tell our story? I'm like, yeah. This, I remember when I was in college, Ithaca College, studying film. I remember sitting in the dorm, dorm hallway Reading, reading, bury my heart at wounded knee. Going someday, I want to do a documentary about something like this. And you know, thirty years later, you know, you know, I have the opportunity, and it's an opportunity. And again, I was, I was, I didn't impose myself on this. Going, hey, I'm here to tell your story. Um, you know, Darren Perry. You know, um, you know, he came to me and, and asked me to do this. So it's like, you know, I'm, I'm honored to do that. And, and this is, you know, a, a slight diversion from the usual films that I do. But still fits in the same pocket. You know, it's human rights. It's a, uh, you know, and this is a, a critical story of of our the narrative of our country that obviously they don't want to tell. If they don't want to talk about slavery. They definitely don't want to talk about the genocide of Native Americans. You know, you know, we just suddenly just have all this land here that just happened to become America, right? So, yeah, this is this is a real downer of a podcast today. <laughs> oh no, it's not. No, it's not to me. Um, no. no, it's like, I, like I said, I love the history. I, yeah. I love the history, especially being from the South. I literally, mm. I am an hour and thirty minutes away from Wilmington, literally driving like mm. this. So it's like, you know, this is the history, you know, and yeah. then we, if we don't learn it, we're doomed to repeat it. So, um, this is why I love watching your stuff. I love watching your stuff and please continue to make it because our students, especially as a former teacher myself, our students need this. They're not yeah. getting this completely in school. So no. please continue to make it. Tell us one more time. How can we, if we want to get this in our, in our town, in our area for our organization, yeah. how can we do this? Very easy. So to, to, to get a screening together, you just go to dying to vote.org. Uh, there's, you know, there's a trailer there. There's an introduction video where I kind of explain things. And then there's a form you fill out, uh, you know, just your name, your name of your organization, if you have a website, uh, contact information, and whether you want me to be there or not, you know, show up on, on Zoom or whatever. And then that's it. You hit send. And the process begins. And, I mean, again, you know, for organizations, we're making it free for them to be able to host these screenings. Um, you know, we're taking away the excuses and giving them an opportunity to have this dialogue about why we need to vote and to, you know, to muster people to get out there and, and make it happen.
Again, thank you for the work that you do. We appreciate you so much. That means when you come back, when you do your next um, project, you got to come back yeah. <laughs> and tell us about that. <laughs> yeah. Well, we talked about my new book. We haven't talked about my new book yet, have we? No, we have not. No? No. Oh, that's the next one. Get back to the counter? No. Seven lessons from a civil rights icon? Oh, man, we skipped one. All right. That's been out for a year. I've been too busy talking about films. Oh, my goodness. <laughs> oh, my goodness. Get his book, Fig Fab. Break him to your child. Loki Bahala, thank you for being with us. Yeah, I appreciate <laughs> it. Fig Fab, don't go away. Back in a moment. This is director Ryan Givens on the Michael Finkley Show. And if you ain't tuned in here, I don't know what you doing, cause this boy good. <laughs>